Welcome to the Black Mist Podcast. Welcome to the Black Mist Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I am your <laughs> co-host, Cameron, and that's the head again charge right there to Black. How you doing today? <laughs> wow, that that was a that was a nice switch. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready. Um, how am I doing today? I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the question, but um, uh, <laughs> I can't even keep it. <laughs> oh god. All right. Oh. Um, yeah. yeah, so um I guess I guess she just passed me back the ball. Um so we today <laughs> today's myth second part is um Marxism is Eurocentric. <clears throat> In the first episode we went over the theory side, showed you some applicability of it, but we didn't get as in, in depth in that. So in this episode, we are um in conversation with uh Dr. Jody Dean and a um, uh, multiple time guests of the show, um, Dr. Sharice Burton Staley, also known as Dr. CBS. And they are putting out a book that they edited called Organize, Ooh. Fight, Win Black Communist Women's Political Writings. So <clears throat> it comes out next week. Pre order it. Yeah, pre order it. It's 40% off if you pre order it. It's on versosoul.com, uh, Verso Books. Um, uh, so this episode <laughs> was, you know, we worked, we worked through it, but it was, it was good to hear just the practical application of like Marxism and socialism by black women. Um, you know, that's what the book is about. And I think it was just good to focus on that. And they have a, a extensive knowledge of about 20 different black women writings, I believe is in the book. Some of them multiple writings, um, but they have an extensive knowledge, not only about those writings, but just about the general history of communism, the Communist Party in the United States, uh, anti-communism, Red Scare, all of these different things. Um, but to see just how people actually implemented the stuff that we talked about. And it's black people. <laughs> it's not a bunch of crackers. You know, it's black people who implemented this and who showed you that this is a, it was actually very common to be in these kind of politics. So today when people say that socialism is white or Marxism is Eurocentric, they quite frankly don't know what they're talking about because the history is pretty clear on this. So, you know, we lay this out um, and our, our guests lay this out more thoroughly. Um, so I uh, can't, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about it and then we can. Yeah, just to clarify, for those who don't know what Eurocentric means, it's an assumption that things are white, you know, white. Like, in Europe. And as we also pointed out in the last <laughs> episode, that has Marxist, that term has Marxist origins too. So it's funny that Marxism gets called Eurocentric, but continue. Yeah. Um, really just want to take it from the theory side and more of the historical context, which is what we offered up last episode. And then really diving today into how has this been applied throughout our history as a people in our fight for liberation. Uh, what does this look like? Who has been utilizing this and what better way to continue to debunk this than by just bringing out receipt after receipt after receipt of, um, of Black people who took this yeah, this notion and ran with it and applied it in their everyday life, especially through um, their work and being able to bring on Dr. CBS um, and Dr. Dean to just really bring light to this um, in a way that I think y'all really enjoy um, in a way that was fun and engaging and that just really brings this to life. Okay, um, so yeah, y'all just heard the um, explanation of the prior episode, and again, we would encourage y'all to go listen to that. Um, we're not going to bore our guests with having to explain all the foundational <laughs> concepts of Marxism. Um, we tried to do the best we could. We didn't explain all of them. And there's also, as Cam always says, the option of just reading a book. Um, so you can try that too. Uh, <laughs> but we want to uh, welcome our guests today. Um, they are the editors of the book, um, Organized Fight and Win, um, Black Communist Women's Political Writing. 
we have both um, Cerise Burton Stelly and we have Dr. Jody Dean. Um, anybody that's listened to this show is, I would imagine, is fairly familiar with Dr. CBS. Like she's been on here. This is, I think, this is the third, third or fourth time. So, um, and so, so um, if you're not familiar, you need to catch up. Um, so, Cam, you can go ahead and read the bios. Yeah. Um, so, welcome back, CBS, and welcome. Um, Dr. Jody Dean. Um, Dr. Jody Dean teaches political, feminist, and media theory in Geneva, New York. She has written or edited 13 books, including The Communist Horizon and Crowds and Party, as well as Comrade and Essay on Political Belonging. All have been published by Verso. And we're also here with Dr. CBS, who's an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies at Wayne State University. She's the author of Gerald Horn of WDE. Du Bois, A Life in American History, and the forthcoming book, Black Scare, Red Scare. Um, we got a variety of questions. We're going to try to just track through the, the different sections of the book. Um, there were five sections, I believe. So we're going to try to track through. Um, I know when just reading the introduction, the book primarily, and correct me if I'm wrong, covers the writings or at least reflections of um, from 19... 19 to 1956. Um, So we're going to try to track through this time. Um, 1919 is following the Russian Revolution. um, And that's relevant considering we are talking about black communist women here. Um, But we really just want to understand the application of Marxism. Because again, the myth that is Eurocentric, I think we already put that to bed, but I think this will just further stop on the grave as far as just establishing that You know, this was this has been implemented and this is just primarily in America as far as the people we're talking about. But their theories expanded throughout and their their understanding of the theory expanded throughout the entire world. Um, So we just want to show how this has been this 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 has been worked with, struggled with. Some people got it wrong. Some people got it right. But it it has been in practice for a long time. This is not something that just white people have been doing. And and anyone that thinks that just hasn't really studied the subject matter. so first, could you all just explain or just discuss just the idea and the thinking behind the book? Because I know you had to arrive at looking through archives, like who you wanted to put in here. And I know they all had multiple writings. So what writings you wanted to publish and then overall, like what you were trying to get across by putting those in, in the book. Um, either one of you can take that question first. OK, Um I'll start us out. So one of the, I mean, I, I'll just give a little bit of a narrative of how we got the book started. Um, um, Charisse and I had met at an event in Seattle, Red May, and then I'd invited her to um, speak at Hobart William Smith Colleges, where I teach. And so I knew that she had real expertise on kind of mid-century communist movement and anti-racist movement in the U.S. and how those were overlapping. And um, and so that was in my head, right? I know she learned from Sharice's expertise. And then I was teaching a course on socialist feminism, and one of my students um, was looking for a text by Louise Thompson Patterson and couldn't find it. So I contact Sharice because I knew she would know how to find this. And Sharice at first thought, well, this shouldn't be a problem. I have a whole lot of text um, from mid-century work. And yet, and she didn't have it. And she contacted some other people and they didn't have it. And then we started to realize in the course of these interactions that there was this whole school of work, this whole bunch of work from really important um, Black women communist writing and, and organizing in the 20th century that no one had collected. And so we we just, we knew that Claudia Jones's work had been collected by Carol Boyce Davies, who also has a really wonderful biography of Claudia Jones. But finding a lot of the different writing was almost, was really, really difficult. And so our first, the first thing was just realizing, oh, this hasn't been collected before and it needs to be, right? These voices, they were active, they were impacting what communism was in the United States. They were impacting global peace movements, and yet the the work wasn't in any way accessible for most people. So that's how we first um, came up with the idea that we needed this. And and then I'll I'll hand off to um, Cherise for more about, you know, the decision-making around what we included. Mm -hmm. So then we came up 
we started by just coming up with a list of the people that we wanted to include. And the list was very, very extensive. And so we had to just make some decisions in terms of who we wanted to include and who was going to be, you know, for the whoever does the next volume. So for example, you'll notice like Shirley Graham Du Bois isn't in there. That just, she was... We also felt like she's somebody that's relatively more accessible than some of the other we, people we profile, like Williana Burroughs. Um, we wanted to have a selection of both women and essays who are writing in this Real time. Quick, I just want people, to, Shirley Graham Du Bois is for people who don't know is. Oh, okay. So Shirley Graham Du Bois was the second wife of W.B. Du Bois, but she was a revolutionary in her own right. Mm -hmm. She was like the right hand woman of Kwame um, Nkrumah at one point. Also, um, Abdul Nasser, she was an internationalist. Um, she was a third worldist and she also was involved in the Harlem Renaissance. So just like a badass, like all the women that we have in this book. Right. Um, and so we wanted to have women who were, who were, who sort of wrote across the breadth of time that we're looking at, which is 1919 to about 1956. Um, and then we had to make some, some choices about what kinds of writing we wanted. And so, um, we decided that we weren't going to have any fiction. The exception to that is the stuff by Alice Childress, um, and her column, um, about Mildred, who is a sort of fictional domestic worker that appeared in in Freedom, but but we wanted to have a sampling of sort of like memoir type writings, um, position papers, speeches, and um, reports like committee reports, just to get a, a, a well rounded sense of the types of of things that Black women were writing and where their theory is grounded. And Jody's daughter actually typed up all of the writings because of course we had like newspaper clippings, we had random archival documents so it all needed to be like typed up in word documents so shout out to Sadie um and then we had a whole we had just a lot of stuff and then we just would whittle it down little by little like if we had too much in the 1950s if we had you know many many things by Esther Cooper Jackson we would take some out um yeah, so that so it just was kind of a process of elimination once we got the word count and once we got a sense of sort of what the spread was, we we were very thin on the sort of on the 1919 and 1920s moment initially. So we had to really look for those pieces. And in terms of that, so we did um, interlibrary loan. As Jody said, I had um, a whole lot of the writings already, but then we hit up other people who were writing in this genre. So like Ninka Makalani, um, Eric Gelman, Melissa Ford, uh, not the not the video vixen. She's uh, <laughs> a woman who studies communism. Uh, that would have been a plot twist. Right. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Denise Lynn, um, Eric McDuffie. So yeah. And, and so a lot of people helped us, they would send the, us the archival documents they had, or they would sort of point us in a particular direction. And so it definitely was a collective and a collaborative effort, but, um, yeah, so that's some of the sort of behind the scenes of how organized fight when came together. Maybe this is also a good time um, to um, just name, you know, say every woman's name and to read out the list of the women that we've included in this. Yeah, that's a great um, idea, Grace, sure. yeah, Grace Campbell, Williana Burroughs, Maud White Katz, Tyra Edwards, Ella Baker and Marvel Cook, Louise Thompson Patterson, Esther Cooper Jackson, Thelma, Thelma Dale, Claudia Jones, and Vicki Garvin. Islanda Good Robeson, Dorothy Hunton, Lorraine Hansberry, Alice Childress, Dorothy Burnham, Yvonne Gregory, and Charlotta Bass. So again, we talked about how this was around the time like you you start like very shortly after the Russian Revolution. Um and you know, Marxist so Marxist Leninism is kind of the dominant strand at the time, um, for I think good reasons. And we talked a little bit in the last episode about I don't feel like we got to get as much into Marxism, the particularly like the Leninism aspect of Marxism as we would have liked. Um, so can you just clarify what Marxist Leninism, what it what it is and what it was to the, to the people at the time and how this seemed to be the dominant strand? And then, um, you know, how does the Communist Party emphasis at the time on um, this is just like a continuation of it because the party emphasized like self-determination, national oppression, and the colonial question to inform the organizing of, com of black communist women. So first just the Marxist Leninism point and then how, and if you can incorporate how they integrated those components of it into the, into the answer, we just want to understand kind of what their f ideological foundation was before we get directly into more of the organizing work. 
Yeah, I'll start us off, um, but I'm going to start us off a little with a sidestep, okay. um, which is um, emphasizing like the first, the um, the earliest text that we have is from Grace Campbell, and this is from I think it's 1928. And what's important, the reason I'm sidestepping this a little bit is Grace Campbell with Cyril Briggs was one of the founders of the African um, Blood Brotherhood, and they had an independent account of the necessity of socialism for Black people in the United States. And it was that that led them to think, okay, this what's going on in Russia makes sense for us. What's right. what Lenin is doing and the Bolsheviks are doing makes sense for us. And so I want to emphasize that because there was this really crucial, independent, very revolutionary analysis that Grace Campbell was instrumental in developing that then starts to coalesce with and reach out to um, the you know um, what's happening in Russia. And I don't mean necessarily personally, but like, but like starts to build as communist because there was already this space. So what does it mean then to be sort of Marxist Leninist? And there are lots of different ways. So Jody, can I just jump in yeah, really yeah, quick? Please. So that's the significance of 1919. On the one hand, that's what there were two communist parties at that time that eventually merged. I yeah. believe this is 1924. So that's the significance of 1919. But that also was the founding of the African Blood Brotherhood. So it is it, it is after the Russian Revolution, but that's the 1919 date. And, so, and the African Blood Brotherhood is a black communist organization, just for the listeners. It it's starts out as nationalist. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it starts out as nationalist, and then the more, um, basically, as the violent, like 1919 was really a, a summer of amazing, of incredible, horrible, racist violence. And as that violence got intensified, the analysis from Cyril Briggs and Grace Campbell um, and other people in their milieu was that there, there was a socialist um, that there was a need for socialism as well, that there needed to be that they, there was an economic set of crises, that there was a revolutionary aspect of this, and that that a, that that the struggle had to be broader. And so I think that one of the things that happens is with this, and, and, and part of this is like the press at the time starts weirdly blaming Bolsheviks for the violence rather than recognizing legitimate um, Black fight back against white racism. Mobs, right. and so there was this very. This yeah. is red. This is red summer, right? In red summer, yeah. So there's a strange way that the that the back that the weird backlash about blaming communist also sort of makes this kind of a well, I guess it may be communist. Mm. <laughs> but there's this kind of interesting sort of um, set of associations. But then on to Marxism Leninism. I mean, the way I think about that is Marxism Leninism in general is an approach that emphasizes the, the revolutionary struggles of oppressed people. And it emphasizes that these struggles can unfold into a horizon that's far beyond what we have, but that would be communist. So that the revolutionary struggles of oppressed people are not simply reformist. They're not just for a better mode of oppression. They're in fact for creating a, an emancipatory egalitarian world where oppression is gone, where everyone is free and where people are able to plan together the the conditions um, that affect their lives. So that's how I understand Marxism, Leninism. It's not a, a textbook answer, um, but it's a kind of first pass. Um, and of course, there's also anti-imperialist and internationalist dimensions, but I'll throw the, the ball over to um, Charisse on that one. Yeah, so to me, Marxism-Leninism is, is effectively the application of scientific socialism by Lenin and the Bolshevik party. It's a sort of, it's the materialization of, of sort of, of, class struggle in an in actual revolutionary context. And then this gets, I think, and this becomes very, very influential to people who are subjected under the yoke of, of colonialism and imperialism, not least because Lenin is one of the sort of most trenchant theorists of imperialism as like the highest stage of capitalism and also the national and, and the colonial questions. And it's the national and colonial questions that really paid attention to um, the racialized world, the world that was under the yoke of colonialism. And then this, and then Lenin also offered a competing vision of self-determination to the self-determination of Woodrow Wilson. 
right? This sort of self-determination that only applied to European nations and that really had no vision for um, liberation for the majority of the world. And so part of that question was sort of how did, um, you know, the, the women that we talk about, how did they, um, how did, how did the national question and like the colonial question inform their organizing? Well, this happened in a number of ways. So 1920 was sort of one of the first kind of systematic engagements with this idea of African-Americans as an oppressed nationality. And Lenin himself had written that the Negroes in the U.S. constituted an oppressed, an oppressed nation, right? And so that's important because that means that Black people are not an ethnicity that are discriminated against, right? Um, they're not a racial group who are sort of... Um, who are marginalized based on the attitudes and the the um you know the biases the, you know the the abstract like idealist right. form of racism they are not they are oppressed as a national minority just like countries in Africa and the Caribbean and India and elsewhere right and so the Black Belt Nation thesis is theorized in 1928 that argues that Black people are, you know, they make up, um, there's there's um, some contingu contiguous states in the South that make up the Black Belt and that this is a sort of Black nation and they have the right to self-determination, including the right to secede from the U.S. if they want to. That part was always contested and it didn't have as much practical application as did the shift of folk, because of the Black Belt Nation thesis that shifted a lot of the so-called Negro work to the South. And that's important because number one, the majority of Black people are in the South. Number two is that it, it forced them to reconceptualize and reimagine like who counts as a worker, right? Agricultural workers, laborers had to be included in this idea of a proletarian revolution because that's the overwhelming majority of Black people were in these, were, were working in sort of rural or agricultural work, such as sharecropping, debt, pe you know, they were debt peons, those types of things. Domestic work. But then what the Black women added was domestic workers. Yeah. That they added that key, key component because more than 65% of Black women up until more than 80% of black women up until 1965 worked in some side of some type of domestic service or service based um, work. So I just want to read this piece from, from Wild White Cats, where she's in, it's in 1932, where she's talking about organizing um, Negro workers and the need to understand them as a oppressed, a, a nationally oppressed minority, and that we don't understand them in that way is problematic. So um, she said, well, a sure test of our understanding of the Negro question in our trade union movement is the manner in which we handle the complaints and grievances of the Negro workers. These reflect not only their economic exploitation, but their social and political oppression as well. Their oppression as a national minority. Some leading comrades in trade union work fail to understand this. Comrade Rose Wardis of the NTWIU states, quote, we handle the complaints of the Negro workers in the same manner as those of the white workers, end quote. This is the prime reason why we can't keep them. <laughs> Need them being Negroes. Um, what does this indicate and where does it lead us? That the Negro workers are not members of an oppressed group, suffer no special um, oppression and discrimination, and um, need no special approach, Negro demands, and leads to neglect and indifference to their everyday needs. Likewise, a denial of the national question, end quote. So that shows the practical application of this analysis of Black people, right? That they that they have a, a form of super exploitation over and above that of the white workers. And therefore, it requires special work, special considerations that take into question not only their, their, their relationship to the capitalist mode of production, but also the forms of um, oppression and sort of social subjection um, and violence that are part and parcel of them being like black workers, right? So anyway, that was very long-winded, sorry. <laughs> well, I think that was great. I just want to add one one little um, addition, um, which is I think that um, for the Communist Party um, at that time period, one of the things that was so crucial about the Black Belt thesis was that it told everyone in the party that the black struggle was objectively revolutionary it meant that look like marxist struggle like communist struggle isn't isn't about some sort of 
working workers that are just white workers and only at the point of production it's like no 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 the national struggle of the of an oppressed national minority in the united states is an objectively revolutionary struggle and so every white worker has the obligation to fully be 100 percent behind every aspect of the black struggle and this is what which is why for um many of the the folks in the party um up till the mid-century or until they they sort of moved away from this thesis. Um, it, the Black Belt thesis was crucial to letting the party be as, you know, at the vanguard of the struggle for Black liberation, right? Then the party itself understood itself as being at the vanguard of that struggle. And it was because of this thesis. Just one more thing. The other important thing about understanding the Black, the, the struggle for Black liberation as objectively revolutionary is that it was the Communist Party that was calling out the class contradictions of the Black struggle. So it's not what, it's not that um, we're rooting for everybody Black. Right. They also, they, like, if they, they realize that if the Communist Party did not support Black liberation, then it was at the will and whim of the petty bourgeoisie, right? And so it also was a responsibility to keep the Black, the struggle for Black liberation focused on the overwhelming majority of Black people, which is, like, workers, right? We, we are a proletarian race, period. And that also comes out of Marxist Leninist thought that, this is why Black people are important to the struggle because we are a race of workers, period. So, no, that's good. And I think often today, uh, when it comes to this, the white Black unity, it gets put in this liberal frame of like white people just need to advocate for us in some abstract. But when I reading through the book and just reading other writings, it's clarified that this is actually in your own interest to advocate for Black liberation. It's this isn't like a side issue which it often gets framed as today where you just need to be an ally or something it's like actually advocating for black liberation helps you as a worker right when we're talking about the particularly poor white people or working class white folks in this case um and i know claudia jones i don't have the quote in front of me but i know in this book she had a really good quote on um about the the black bourgeoisie and how to to your point about how that um if you don't clarify this question then they will kind of assume the interests of everyone else and move it in a different direction. We're in section one, um, struggle in the early years. So there's a quote from Williana Burroughs. I want to read, just kind of set that section up. Um, the Negro in strikes of all workers in America, the Negroes have the largest percentage of constant unemployment. This makes a vast reserve labor army always available in strikes. They were used to break the steel strike, the dock strike in New York, the coal strike in Pennsylvania, the paper box strike, and many others. Our left-wing unions have not succeeded in rousing the Negro masses so that they will refuse to serve during an industrial crisis. So this points to some of these class contradictions that you were talking about. Um, so I guess first question on that, um, how was racism understood by black women of the earliest, early, excuse me, how was, race, how was racism understood by black women of the early communist period? I'm talking about the period, the, the early period that you're describing in the book um, in relation to the struggle for organizing for workers. Well, I think that they understood very well that even in a party of like white workers that white chauvinism and white supremacy were a thing and that part of what needed to be done was to part part of the negro work was also to to have white communists constantly overcoming white chauvinism right and then they also understood that racism was a means of, of splitting the working class right that it was a way to um to make race, right? This is the sort of like ideal, idealist aspect, right? It, it was to make people take um, the idealist sort of notion of racism and put it over and above their material interests. Now, there were there were there is some aspect of sort sometimes of of um, communist thought that can that can sort of position racism as um distraction yeah at, or as like just the machinations of like the ruling class right but i think that what black women constantly showed was that white workers 
have are racist too and that right. they think this is in their interest but indeed and in fact they're actually what Williana Burroughs is pointing out here is that they're when you choose sort of race consciousness over class consciousness you're working against your own interests because your strikes are unsuccessful because they're using black people as scabs and not only that black people because when you pay black people abysmal wages it pushes everybody's wages down right Right. When you when you have black people working in the worst conditions, yes, that's Negro work, but your conditions are pushed down as well because the floor is much lower. And so I think that that's part of what these women pointed out, especially with Negro women workers, because as bad as it was for 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 black men, it was even worse uh, for black women, not least because they were locked, uh, locked out of particular industries. But also they had like the worst of the worst work. And so um yeah, so that is a little above and beyond what you asked about how they understood race, but I think that that's that's kind of how our women are thinking about it at that time. Yeah, I would just add in um, there, but a lot of the analysis is is really concrete, right? Like Jim Crow laws. The failure of, of you know, later a little later in the period, the failure the failure of Harry Truman to even acknowledge what's going on in the South, right? The reality of the poll tax, um, the reality of lynching, right? They are um, the the reality of of young black men being accused um, of rape by you know two white women. I'm thinking of the Scottsboro Boys um, trial. And so one of the things that they're very concrete about are discrimination in housing as, as another um, sort of concrete thing is that they are always drawing out the concrete material impacts of a racist society, of racist discrimination, um, and how that is part, that's what gives, um, real body to their account of of triple oppression and triple exploitation and real um, body to their emphasis on the the reasons that white workers have to acknowledge and understand and learn about and fight against the ways that black workers are are oppressed and discriminated against is that this whole Jim Crow structure is actually also hurting the white working class because it adds to the special oppression of black people that has to be addressed if there's going to be anything like a strong working class in the U.S. There's going to be anything like, um, you know, some kind of justice for working people. Mm -hmm. I just want to take a second to just like allow for that to say, because I think there's such a, there's such a necessity for folks to recognize that I think so often, like when we're talking, we were talking about this um, in our previous episode that when people look at the work and when we, especially when we were debunking Marxism as being Eurocentric, it was this notion of like, so many people were advocating that this was a problematic type of ideology and work as a whole, because it wasn't just coming from all black people. But when recognizing that like, there's a need for all of us to be able to collectively be working together, as you just said, in order for liberation to come from the bottom up, I think that, it just brings a, a whole new foundation to like, what does it mean for us to just like actually come to a place in which we can recognize our humanity. You know, I think that when we constantly just view it as black people are just a, a body, we are just here to function. We are just here to serve. We are just here to work. And we don't recognize the ways in which we are being exploited and by our, our expectation is leading to everyone else's as well, then like nothing gets done. All right. Um, so that kind of wraps up the first section. Uh, and again, I want people to just know that the book is broken up into five different sections with a variety of chapters within those sections. Um, so the second section, um, section two, organizing labor and militancy. Um, and there's a few things in here to to pick out. Um, I think there's a little bit more theorizing in this one and also just dealing with the question of organizing labor um, and understanding the labor force and what the specificities are, particularly to black women. Um, so um, Louise Thompson um, says, quote, over the whole land, Negro women meet this triple exploitation as workers, as women and as Negroes. About 85% of all Negro women workers are domestics, two thirds 
of 2 million domestic workers in the United States. In smaller numbers, they are found in other forms of personal service. Um, so this term triple exploitation, and this is, t- y'all talk about this a bit in the, I think in the introduction, um, is often seen as like this predecessor of intersectionality. Um, so should we read triple exploitation or triple exploitation as an early form of intersectionality, Dr. CBS? Yeah, um, of course. I think so, you know, because all black women, if they say the same things and they have the same aims because they're black women and they all belong to a homogenized black women's intellectual tradition. So, of course, <laughs> obviously, that is a uh, sarcasm. That is all cap. But so the easiest way to think to, to put this is that triple exploitation is a specific enunciation of anti-imperialism and an analysis of the relationship of black women workers to the capitalist mode of production and the social relations emanating therefrom. That is triple oppression or triple oppression. It's called triple oppression and triple exploitation. Intersectionality is about the recognition of black women before the law. In the United States, class objectively cannot be a protected category. So if we look at it in this way, they are fundamentally different political projects. Recognition before the law and the overthrowing of the capitalist imperialist system are two fundamentally different objectives, which make them two fundamentally different modes of analysis. Um, Even if the what seems the same, the so what is different. So that's the sort of most simple way to put it. Right. So it seems like often it's used to understand identity, but the um, intersectionality, even if I don't know if that was always a, even the full intent of Crenshaw, to be fair. But does triple exploitation would not be reducible to identity? Is that a fair point? They don't oh. talk about. Go ahead, Jody. No, I was about to say. I was about to say earlier. Like, I mean, I didn't. When you first started to answer CBS, I almost like freaked out. I was like, "What? I didn't. She didn't think that." And then I was like, "Of course, she changed." But I was just like, "Oh my god!" I was like, "Like, like, <laughs> it was really about to freak out." Like, but like you, you had me. <laughs> so, um, and I. Um, but anyway, so that was my my first response. But um, but then I think going back to what you were saying, um, yeah, it's. I mean, at least from from my my less sophisticated um, understanding, like, and it's, and I think you're right. It's not fair to to blame Kimberly Crenshaw on this, but every, but in everyday life, or or sort of the politics from you know that got run through Hillary Clinton and runs all over the internet, it associates intersectionality with identity. And as CBS was starting to say, there is, I don't think the word identity appears anywhere in the in the in these writings prior to 1956, anywhere in the book um like they don't they're not talking about their identities they're talking about structures of oppression exploitation that have to be overthrown and what so for example people say we have to be more intersectional in our analysis or this was an intersectional meeting you can't turn triple oppression into a adjective in that way what's it like you can't you know what i mean like it's not, it, it just doesn't do the same work, right? There's no like triple oppressionary meeting because it's not, that's not the point of the analysis, if that makes right. sense. It, it's not a buzzword. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think I think that they're trying to understand a relationship to production on some, on some level. And I don't think intersectionality, like you said, is trying to understand a relationship to the law. And like you said, those are very distinctly different things. I mean, and often intersectionality now isn't even applied to understand the relationship to the law. It's just kind of used fluidly for anything. But I guess I guess I appreciate that answer because it's just we don't often hear about, um, particularly with black women, the relationship to production or just labor um, and, and, and those material conditions. It's often more of an abstract like. Uh, metaphysical kind of oppression or an idea that people have about black women. And that's not to say that that's not part of it, but it just seems like that doesn't, that, that becomes the dominant way we come to understand it. Not so much like it says here, um, 85% of all Negro women workers are domestics and trying to understand like what to do about that. Well, if you think so, Again, not putting the blame per se on anybody, but if you Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Thought, she has this big section on controlling images. And the problem with and she's she's right to point out the sort of stereotypes, what I would call legitimating architecture. But the problem is that the 
the the rationalization for why it is that black women are triple exploited becomes the problem itself. So it's the image of black women. It's the idea of black women that becomes the form of oppression as opposed to the oppression itself. And so over time, we just see more, we st- we see, and I, you know, I'm all right, I'm actually gonna write a book about this. We move, we go from concrete to more and more extract over time. So we go from triple oppression and triple exploitation to this jeopardy language. And then we end up at intersectionality. <laughs> and so that, and, and this has a lot to do with um, epistemology. It has a lot to do with just sort of um, knowledge regimes. It has a lot to do with with shifts in political economy and the way that that is entwined with knowledge production. And I don't. It's not that we're necessarily saying one is bad or good, but the problem is that when intersectionality becomes understood as the pinnacle or the apotheosis of like liberation or of radical thought. That's when it becomes then the all of the liberalism that's concealed in the use in the sort of employment of intersectionality, um, it's concealed, right? It becomes hidden under this just this idea, this this right. idea that intersectionality is the most radical way of thinking, just because somebody said it was. We don't do any in- interrogation beyond that. Uh, could either of you just explain the Bronx slave market known as the Mar and like what made it a cipher investigation? Sure, I'll talk about it. This appears in an essay from Ella Baker and Marvel Cook, and they're talking about a few corners, um, street corners um, in Harlem, where um, women who were looking for domestic work, particularly during the Depression, um, would wait on the street corner for other people um, um, to come and basically buy them for the day. And so it was a market for domestic workers. Now, when they're talking about that, when um, Ella Baker and Marva Cook are talking about this, they're focusing on um, Black women domestic workers who are looking for work. Many of them would have had um, really pretty decent domestic work jobs um, prior to the Depression in wealthy homes. And now, because of the conditions of the Depression, um, you know, everybody gets pushed further down and they get, and, and these domestic workers get pushed so far down that they're not working for single households, they're working as day laborers. And then the people they're working for are typically now much more um, working class white women who um, have an opportunity, They these white women think, to get cheaper labor. And so they come in and they try to bargain down the um, black women to push their wages as low as they can. And so the conditions are really, really horrible for the domestic workers, right? They are the, they're the you know, white women want them want to pay them less and less. The domestic, the women looking for domestic work are trying really hard to get something because you know, often that um, if, if their other people in their household are also out of work and so the family's depending on them. And so the market conditions are really bad and they're driving down the wages. And one of the things that's interesting to Marvel Cook and Ella Baker is how these street corners are actually a microcosm of the capitalist labor market more broadly. And it's a microcosm of the challenges of organizing. It's not, I mean, it's or, it's hard to organize domestic workers, but they don't even, they, but um, Cook and Baker are saying like, but it's hard to organize all workers and all workers benefit by having unity together because if you're unified, then you won't drive down the wages of other people. So it's a really nice illustration of the challenges of, of organizing and the need for unity. So just to add a couple of other points, something that's really, really important that they say in that piece is that this Bronx slave market actually uh, resulted in the formation of a white, often Jewish uh, class of new employers who were kind of like lower middle class housewives who couldn't have previously afforded um, a maid, but they found themselves able to do so because of, they said, quote, Negro women pressed to the wall by poverty, starvation, and discrimination. So the Bronx slave market becomes a basis of class formation, right? Of the ability of a new sort of employing, this new employing class with all of the sort of 
rep- rep- like repressive social relations that come with that. The other thing that they talk about is the sexual harassment um, to which these women are subjected, number one, from literally being on the outside in open air, this open air like labor market, um, but also subjected to like the sexual advances of like the sons and husbands of these women that they're working for. The other thing that makes it like a Bronx, uh, uh, that makes it like a slave market is, is that the women are actually coming, testing their knees. They're like testing their knees, looking at their muscles to see if they'll be, be able to get on their hands and knees to scrub these floors. It's and like here's an the gag. Block. What'd you say? It's not like an auction block or something. It literally is a slave market and the gag is in 1950 um when marvella cook goes on to work for the new york compass so the first piece was in the naacp but when she went in 1950 when she's working for the new york compass the the bronx slave market is still there or it's returned after world war ii because black women were um pushed out systematically from whatever small industrial gains they had made and at that time in the 1930s they're making about 35 cents a day it's only they're making 75 cents a day in 1950. And so, it, again, if they're being paid at all, because oftentimes these these white women would find some quibble or some reason not to pay the women at all. The other interesting thing is that there's some pseudo organizing that's actually happening in these markets because um, they would all get together and say, we're not going to accept anything below this wage. And oftentimes black women who had newly migrated from the South would accept something lower. And so they would literally chase their ass off the block. They would just be like, no, because if they took that lesser um, fee, Again, that pushes the wages down for everybody. So there was some sort of um, solidarity that was happening um, for Black women to be able to protect themselves and each other from um, even even in this sort of highly exploitative labor market. They're still trying to sort of get the make the best of a bad situation. One of the things that I kind of imagined when we um, decided to um, have this piece in the book is I started imagining it in um, classroom settings and maybe in um, you know women's studies courses or something because what's a wonderful contrast to me is Ella Baker and Marvel Cook's solution is not like oh sisterhood and the white women and who are trying to employ the black women just need to understand their sisterhoodness no the solution is organizing as a labor force against the exploitive conditions um, and that it's the unity that comes from labor organizing that's so the solution not some kind of I don't know cum, you know everybody come together and and sing a song and all be sisters right that's not where the power is and so that's one of the things that I like about this is a kind of contrast with um, some versions of, of of feminism or women's studies. Yeah, and I think you can see the um, triple exploitation in this example <clears throat> without having to even be, you know, super dogmatic about it. It's just there. It, it just readily, you know, explains itself by the things you already laid out as far as the, <clears throat> the actual, obviously the work and then being black and then also even the sexual harassment that comes with this um, and then trying to figure out, you know, means to organize. When, um, when Ella Baker and uh, Marvel Cook went they just you can speak a little bit more they actually went under they went undercover or they went as if they were their own domestic workers too to investigate this is, is that isn't is that how it went if i remember correctly yeah so it's a form of investigative journalism and that's also what is so important about this piece it shows that so often for our women for people like claudia jones um um lorraine hansberry um as londa good robeson journalism and organizing and activism were intertwined. They were mutually constitutive, right? That journalism was another form of sort of conscious, it was a form of consciousness raising. And so it's really, and so it's really important that um, they participated in the brown slave market because that also shows their political orientation, right? They're not Particip- you know, they're not going to just watch other people be exploited. They want to experience it for themselves, which is also like a form of solidarity to see like how this is actually operating. And so they see themselves as 
one in the same with these domestic workers. And that's also important because Marvel Cook, she grows up petty bourgeois. Like she's um, from Minnesota. She's from like a, a, a white neighborhood in Minnesota. She's relatively affluent. Her first boot thing was Roy Wilkins, the scrub for NAACP. But anyway, she got over him. But that's important because these are the like uh, Marvel Cook in particular, like she's she's committing class suicide, right? And I think that that's also something that we can take from, for many of these women, women, they run the gamut in terms of class. Some are working class, like Claudia Jones, like Williana Burroughs. Some are petty bourgeois, like Louise Thompson Patterson and Marvell Cook, but they really are about the liberation of the working class, irrespective of their class status. So again, it's not rooting for everybody black. It is organizing the most oppressed and the most exploited so that, and that's how we all, be free, right? So anyone. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I added this late, but I think this is an easier, easy question because I've, I've heard CBS talk about this, but um, there's also organizing on the Scottsboro Boys case. Um, you can, one, if you could just talk briefly about what that is, and then two, like, um, how did that, how did the organizing around that case, um, <clears throat> you know, influence the, um, influenced this the civil rights movement that we come to understand like later on in time like the more so the strategies and tactics around it so with the scottsboro boys case that involves um nine young black men who are accused of raping um two white women um on a train and they get um convicted and it's a it's a terrible case. It's um, and the Communist Party starts um, organizing around it, and they they start organizing around it in part um, as a way to bring in more black people into the party, and as a way to show the commitment of the party to um, opposing lynch law in the South and to you know actually into fighting for justice. So the the big thing is just using the case as a way to organize. Um, in um, Organized Fight Win, we have um, a number of the pieces talk about it, but one of the ones that's, um, I think, really super is um, Louise Thompson Patterson's um, discussion, because she talks about it in some really practical terms, like um, creating a large march in Washington, bringing, how do you bring people to a march, right? How do you book the buses? How do you man the phones? How do you get people there? What do you, what do, you do um, on a long drive? Like, you know, stopping, stopping for bathroom breaks, stopping for lunch, right? Just the, the nuts and bolts of organizing um, becomes something really self-conscious. And she was saying that, in fact, large-scale marches weren't used um, until the communists were using them. And so this is a development of the tactics of struggle, the tactics of organized struggle that um, comes about because of this work. Now, at the same time, they're using um, they're using um, the um, what is it? ILD International Legal Defense. Um, they've got a court strategy going on. Um, they use they do some of that cooperatively with the NAACP, although the uh, the communists are leading the way. But what's really, um, to my mind, really really exciting is the way that they use you know mass street level organizing in order to try to um, bring more people into the movement and the struggle. What is something that is incredibly remarkable about the Scottsboro case is that Ruby Bates, one of the women who claimed to have been raped, actually flipped and started working um, to get, she lied, right? She admitted that she lied and she started to work with um, the um, International Labor Defense and with um, people like Louise Thompson Patterson to try to um, overturn their conviction. And so, and Louise Thompson Patterson was like integral to that. So to the point where like Ruby Bates would like stay at her home, um, they developed like a strong friendship. And that to me, just it just shows the like, um, he, the, the, the kind of kindness, right, of and the the com the comradely nature of many of of the these women that we talk about because there was every reason to have smoke, right? Just like how people have all this smoke for that white lady that got Emmett Till murdered. <laughs> There's every reason to have that smoke for for these um, for for Ruby Bates and not forgive her at all and not let her be able to try to atone and make up for what she did. But again, they understand that. These white girls, they're working class too. They were on that train in the context of the Great Depression and, and dressed up as men because they didn't have work either. They were looking for work, right? And they were engaging in, in prostitution because the realities of the Great Depression 
push them to, um, you know, push, push them to, to be engaging in, in those acts. And so, and we have to understand that this is in the context of the man act. If it is that they had not blamed these black boys for rape, then they themselves would have been thrown in jail uh, under the man act, which is um, called like the white slavery act. It has to do with like human trafficking. That was about white women being taken across <laughs> state lines for sexual slavery. Anyway. Um, so to make a, I'm rambling at this way, but to make a short story long, I always thought that that part was that sort of relationship was, was quite compelling and really points out the ethics of communism, right? That the sort of the ethics of comradeship, um, because that was a, I think that that was a really important friendship. And then Ruby Bates ultimately became a really important sort of advocate for getting the boys out. So, and then again, Louise Thompson Patterson is somebody that helped very much with consciousness raising with, um, with her. One more, one more point um, on that case. Did didn't the NAACP try to like jack that from the Communist Party? Like jack the K, like split up the families or something like that. There was a lot. So there was a lot of back and forth. The NAACP and the ILD got on the case around the same time. Um, the NAACP wanted to pursue a wholly legal strategy, whereas the ILD was much more interested in. Um, a mass based struggle, right? As they really, as Jody said, they really kind of innovated that approach. We see it again with Rosalie Ingram um, in the 1950s with Willie McGee with the Martinsville Six and the, uh, wait, the Trenton, the Martinsville, the Trenton Six and the Martinsville Seven, these other cases of, of what they call legal lynching. But um, yeah, so the, the NAACP, even Du Bois, Du Bois at this time, he, he, as we know, he ended up joining the Communist Party in 1961. At this time, he was, critical of the the involvement of the ILD because number one, he said it was a communist front. And number two, because he said that the communists were basically trying to use, um, use this case for their own particular gain. But indeed, and in fact, they, first of all, a lot of case law came out of the Scottsboro case. One of the main cases is Powell v. Alabama. And I, um, and that is, that is what has led to like Fair, fair jury selection, right? Or that we have to be judged by a jury of our peers. That's Powell v. Alabama. Gerald Horn has a book on that. Anyway, but both the NAACP and the ILD worked together on that. So the ILD was doing legal work, but they also were organizing the mass movement. And it is the mass movement. It's the international attention they brought to that case that ultimately led some people, some were freed, some died in prison, one dude escaped. Anyway, so, but but that even kept the case being litigated for a very, very long time. It wasn't just the legal work. So there was a lot of smoke between the ILD and the NAACP. NAACP is notoriously, um, at this time, they're not, they're, they'll, they'll become the Cold War liberals that they are later on, but they are, they share a lot of the same anti-communist red baiting um, ideas that the government does. Right. Um, and and I just it, it is just an important point, like 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 you both made as far as just that this kind of like mass mobilizing wasn't um, something that this was something that the Communist Party did. So like to this day, that's people's almost like knee jerk reaction is to just be like, you know, we're going to show up in mass downtown or something like that, even if whether it's effective or not, like that now that's just something we regularly understand as something to do. Um, but in this time, like you, like y'all pointed out, the legal strategy was more the route to go. And I can understand that somewhat because you are dealing with lynchings and all of these things. Like there's, it's not like there's not any real consequences. So I get why some people felt like that was a, the relevant strategy, but um, I do think that's just an important point to highlight specifically for the myth, because, again, the very thing that we think we need to do now when someone gets shot by the police or something of that nature comes from the Communist Party. Um, and obviously, we're often, you know, many people from various backgrounds and colors and everything else will arrive downtown or something to, you know, to protest that. Um, I don't think that's Eurocentric. So, <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, moving to the next section and section three on uh, fighting fascism, I found this one interesting just because you got you just got to see the broader theories that that um, black women had on this subject matter. But Cam, you can take it. 
Yeah. So how is beating fascism understood by the likes of like Thelma Dale and Claudia Jones? Like, why did they not only understand fascism as like a foreign enemy to black people? Um, this one might be a relatively short answer because I think that the answer boils down to freaking white supremacy, right? Um, um, Claudia Jones also talks about this as Hitlerism, but what's behind Hitlerism? A- Aryanism and white supremacy. And to the extent that you know that the U.S. fails to combat. Aryanism and white supremacy at home, they have not defeated fascism, right? They are, in fact, complicit with fascism and even a fascist country. So that it boils down to the way that um, the war, war for democracy was a war fought against uh, Hitlerite ideology, and yet um, that's not what was present in the U.S. And it became more and more apparent to, um, you know, even to the um, soldiers during the war, to black nurses during the war, and then when they come home and they're shoved, um, shoved out of jobs and experience racism again, it's just like, wait a minute, the whole, the kind of hypocritical nature of the whole thing starts to get revealed. The whole, the kind of false nature of the fight, of the fight that everybody said they were involved in for democracy starts to be revealed yeah i mean already in like 1935 like george padmore um george padmore left the communist party because part of what he was saying part of their part of his analysis and i know he's not in this book and like you know a lot of communists have smoke for him because he left but um basically the uh, they understood that fascism was the kissing cousin of imperialism and colonialism that it is the the colonial situation for example that like um energized Mussolini to invade Abyssinia in 1935 and then League of Nations didn't do shit despite the fact that Ethiopia was a member of the League of Nations at that time and I think that 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 a lot of the women that we um profile shared that analysis they understood the deep relationship between fascism and imperialism and because imperialism is a a sort of cornerstone of the national character of black oppression in the united states they understood that the persistence of racism and jim crow in the u.s is basically a particular u.s brand of fascism and after world war ii claudia jones and many uh, other black um, communists talk about this, right? And so, you know, Thelma Jell and her piece, she says, you know, the military victory over fascist racism and aggression has not yet been translated into terms of freedom and equality for Negro Americans. And so one can interpret that as saying that fascism hasn't really been defeated because all of all of those conditions that were applied in Europe are still strong and alive and well um today (laughs) right and it's important to point out just like this section is is if i remember correctly is is around the time of world war ii um you know so fascism not that it started in world war ii but that it's it's obviously on the rise during that time period um and 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 black people are being asked to go to war to fight fascism while it's obviously here at home and i that you know and that contradiction uh, is, is, is even when people even once the war is over and people come home and they're like I fought this and here I am dealing with it when I come home like that is a, a raging contradiction like it's almost impossible to not feel that you know so I think it's good that this wasn't just something that people felt but people wrote on this stuff um, and, and it wasn't just a communist to be fair like that double V campaign victory at home and victory abroad that is precisely what they're talking about mm-hmm right? Victory at home means victory against these fasc- if fascist liked characteristics at home as we're defeating like these Nazis, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, because even if you're just a soldier who went to war, whether you're in the Communist Party or not, you know, and you come home and you got to deal with this bullshit, you know, it just, it's, it's just, it's just hard to not see that. <laughs> so, you know, it's just hard to not feel like there, there's something wrong here. And, and like y'all talked about earlier, and it's and it's in the book about how, for a small period, the working conditions improved. You know, because you had, you know, because you they amped up production. The United States amped up production so they could go to war. So so some black people were able to get jobs that they couldn't get prior to that war. 
And then when the soldiers start coming home, the, they're getting pushed out of the market that they were once in. You know, GI Bill is not very applicable to black soldiers and so on and so forth. So, you know, the contradictions are all, 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 are all over the place. But at the same time, um, the riot, like particularly, you know, post-World War II and even be prior to it, like there's this uh, there's a second Red Scare that's really in action. Um, and so I guess I'm curious and I'm not quite sure. So I'm really just curious to answer this question as far as like, um, there seemed to be some revisionism going on, like Claudia Jones wrote about um, Earl Broder, um, and he said, uh, quote, the crisis of history has taken a turn of such character that the Negro people in the United States have found it possible to make their decision once and for all. I don't know when they voted, but once and for all, their decision is for their complete integration into the American nation as a whole and not for separation. This was Earl Broder who wrote, I believe, in the communist or something of that nature. I don't have it next to me, but this is something that was written by a so-called communist. And then she was, and then Claudia Jones responds in a longer essay. This is just a quote, um, a, a quote that we pulled. What does integration really mean? Integration that is democratic integration means breaking down the fetters, which prohibit the full economic, political and social participation of Negroes in all phases of American life. This does not mean that a merger or an assimilative process necessarily takes place. And this is pushing back on this and also how it seemed that the we talked about the black belt thesis a negro question seeing that that was starting to get alienated for other other means so i'm curious like how much of that is just the anti-communism of the period what are the other factors that contributed to what seems to 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 be a move away from a a more emphasis on black liberation and and that's what claudia jones in this particular essay seemed to be wrestling with or, or even calling out you know, I um, you know, on one hand, we could just say this is um, it was a symptom of Earl Browder's um, opportunism and his um, unfortunate revisionism to try to um, essentially put aside any kind of revolutionary um, understanding of class struggle in the United States. I mean, that might be a little bit too harsh, but the approach was um, the that the struggle against um, um, fascism was the most important, that the United States wasn't in going to be in a revolutionary situation, that that's not where the class struggle was, and that Black people really preferred integration to any kind of, of um, national self-determination. So it was overall a, um, a move towards a reformist approach, an electoral approach. I would even, this is a again, maybe too extreme or unfair, but a social democratic approach rather than a Marxist-Leninist approach to any um, to any struggle, class struggle, race struggle, um, anti-imperialist struggle, anti-colonial struggle. I mean, it was it was just straight up revisionism. Um, is it because of anti-communism in the period? I think the revisionism happens before. Um, though, I mean, I don't know. That, that's also considering anti-communism as a long arc. Right. Uh, that might not be totally accurate, but it's not the same as the buildup from the 40s when the revisionism happens. And that's one of the things I think makes Claudia Jones, um, among the many things, so strong and powerful because she's writing this and she's speaking out at a time when McCarthyism is starting to build up. And yet she makes the more radical um, argument, um, emphasizes the more radical position, even as anti-communism is building up. So I don't think that Earl Browder gets off the hook like, oh, he's compromising because of, of you know the, of the the pressure of anti-communism I think he's compromising because of the United front approach which is leading him to try to basically to throw any radical position working class um, black people that goes on that that's thrown out in favor of some kind of um, yeah more uh, more petty bourgeois approach to politics. Yeah, this is not just the the CPUSA. This is the end of the third period is policy for the international communist movement writ large. So I think that that's important to note. Like um, the third period is like the class against class period. And that ends in 1935. And the shift in 1935 is to the popular front strategy. Again, these are strategies. And so uh, 
we believe it's wrong headed. And it's interesting because now the whole rise of Pat so so patriotic socialism is very is very Earl Browder. Like it it gives Earl Browder right. But I but again, so it's not, I don't think it is not a function in my perspective perspective from um of anti-communism not least because even so there's these different upticks in sort of anti-communist one is the first or anti-communism one of which is the first red scare then there's the the formation of the fish committee in the 1930s then in 1939 after the so-called stalin hitler pact this is when there's the passage of the um hatch act this is in 1939 so that's another huge uptick in uh, our uh, upsurge in anti-communism prior to like um um, McCarthyism. So like the, the 1951 moment, which is actually the Korean War. So anyway, um, all of that to say, I think that it's a function. These are the exigencies of any popular front or united front strategy. This is why it's so I'm so ambivalent about them, because ultimately it is always the radicals that have to move to the right as opposed to the um, liberals moving to the left. It's it's a moderating strategy because you converge around a particular issue or set of issues. In this case, um, um, fighting fat like, you know, fighting fascism. And so um, I think that it also attests to like the durability of white supremacy. Um, because part of the thing about the black part, again, one of the very important things about the black belt nation thesis and, and about that sort of 1928 moment is that it forces organizing in the South and it forces at least rhetorically the party to take black, the Negro question very seriously. And then when you move away from the, the right to self-determination that allows for that lets sort of takes Puts, puts one's foot on the brake uh, when it comes to like the Negro question, because that needs to be subsumed to this broader fight against fascism. And, you know, that is the, especially in the context of the United States, that's the, that's the set point. White supremacy is like, that is the sort of, that's the, the natural point you have to, and, and white people have to constantly fight this to overcome it. So um, and just to um, continue with um, CBS's point, when when the party moved away from the um, Black Belt Nation thesis, they also lose the um, focus um, on the horrible things that are going on in the South. They lose the perspective for fighting against poll taxes, Jim Crow's, the the um, blocking of Black people from being able to vote. And so, and, and just the incredible amount of violence that's happening in the South. And that had been a major part of their organizing earlier. And then it becomes, oh, well, there's no right to a national self-determination. It's uh, just an, another oppressed national minority. Then the goals will be integration into American society along with everybody else and everything will be fine. So they lose the capacity to fight one of the major battles that matters in the country. And I think what's interesting, one way we can also think about this is that it's really the Negro question that is in many ways a radicalizing tendency because what goes hand in hand with this is that the communist party comes out against strikes during the war. And so there's a moderating tendency all around. So it seems that when there's a strong commitment to the Negro work, right, to the lip, to black liberation, that radicalizes like, mm -hmm. right, the, the line all around. And then when there's a turn away from that, there's also the simultaneous turn away from like, the more radical aspects of like labor organizing. So I'm not saying it's causal, you know, it might be just parallel, but I think that that's, it's important to point that. Right. Yeah. I mean, we had a few other questions on some of the impacts of red scare. So I don't want to get too much into that, but I am, I just want to ask one question before we get to the freedom papers, as far as like, I guess for the for folks who would accuse Marxism of being Eurocentric, I think a moment like this would be something, I don't think it would be principle, but it would be a, something that somebody would use because there did seem to be, um, some folks would go as far as even say a betrayal um, on, on the struggle uh, on, of black folks within the party. Um, so how do you all reconcile with that moment in history? And more so, I'm just curious why, for the listeners, why the turn towards the popular front and less on the kind of national liberation question? <clears throat> um, every real life party 
is going to make mistakes Mm -hmm. and every real life party is going to make hard choices and we can hold um, parties up um, as we're in them. We can hold them up retroactively and saying you failed here. But I think that to, to say that an entire um, political approach like Marxism Leninism is, is damned because of the, the, failure of the CPUSA just strikes me as as utterly incongruous. I mean, most people who are committed to something like freedom or democracy don't say, oh, well, this person was free and they did shit. I mean, or they did bad things, right? So freedom is bad. No, you don't say that. You don't say, oh, democracy is bad because this democracy has done, you know, has made mistakes. You you hold them up to, you hold the ideals up to the, the parties and the people and the governments who fail them. So the first thing is, it, it's just, it's not a critic. it's not a damnation of, an, of a wide scale, you know, over hundred year old political approach to find a party when it makes mistakes. Um, so that's what, that's what would be my first pass at, at that, you know, we're Responding to that criticism. Yeah, you know, I agree. And there is people still rock with the Universal Negro Approval Association despite Garvey meeting with the KKK. People still rock with the NAACP despite all the goofy shit that they did over and over up to and including trying to recruit South Africans from the ANC to work with the CIA. Like, you know, so it's like if we're going to be principled, be be even, be right. even, Stephen. Right. You know, because the CPUSA is far from perfect. They, for example, one of their biggest fucking blunders was not backing the Socialist Workers Party. And when they were first, they were the first people that were attacked under the Smith Act. Now, granted, they're the mortal enemies of the CPUSA, but it's like if you are talking about white supremacists, like anti radical governance. Then you like in this moment, you do not cheer their demise because they're coming for you. And guess what happened? They came for the it became totally about targeting the CPUSA. So but what what that leads me to is that what our women realized was that you don't just abandon the party because they make mistakes. You struggle within it to get them back on track. Just like any, it's, and we see, you know, the same people who are talking that bullshit now about like, you know, this points to Marxism, Marxism, Leninism being a failure are the same types of people that are like, well, you can't join an organization because there are abusers in organizations. Right, right, right. These are contra- these are the realities of being in a capitalist world system. The contradictions right. are going to be there, period. Right. And so what we need to look at is how are these black women challenging the party? How are they pushing back against what they think is the incorrect line while still having discipline, while still understanding what the bigger fight is. That is what the takeaway should be in my perspective. No, that was a good answer. Because, because yeah, I just, I think it's, it's to, to both of your points, it's not fair to find a mistake, um, even if it was a fatal mistake, and, and, and ascribe that to be a consistent pattern that this whole thing called communism called marxism called whatever words people want to use is all bad and it's racist because of this and then and then to your point cbs about just the contradictions of living in this world that means anywhere you go you're going to run into these factors and that can't be an excuse to damn uh any particular one idea solely on the fact that racism shows up in it because that's going to show up everywhere in some ways to shape or form like you can't avoid that and it just seems really idealist and odd to expect one particular ideology to hold that line perfectly and then, but everybody else can have all these contradictions and we can still try and believe in it and say it's part of some liberatory struggle it just it's just a it's just an odd contradiction um but I don't think we do a good job sometimes of just wrestling with failures that movements have, you know. So when they fail, everybody's a sellout or, you know, depending on the situation, everybody's racist or everybody's sexist. Like, and there's a real strong push nowadays to look back on not just communism or the Communist Party, but just any of these, any of the movements that we kind of celebrate to look back on them and, and give them this kind of hard line push that, you know, if you find out that Dr. King based on FBI evidence out of all things, um, it was cheating on his wife or whatever, then that damns, you know, all black men in the period or black leadership or something, or you find out that somebody, you know, turned this way, you know? So I just think that that's, I don't think that that's a very principled criticism really across the board, let alone when we're talking about communism. 
Uh, and if we're gonna and if we're gonna keep it ten toes down, they were with the Black Belt thesis in this time period longer than they weren't. From 1928 to 1935, it was Black Belt Nation thesis. From 1935 to about 1942-43, that was Broderism. From 1943 until the end of the time period, they go back to the Black Belt thesis and Black self-determination. So what is you even saying? Right. So even on your own judgment, if that was an abysmal failure and represented white supremacy, well, they bounce back. So then like, how are we actually having a true evaluation and assessment is the question. Right, right. Um, so on to the fourth section. Um, didn't have as many questions. I'm really curious more so what what you all have as far as some of the maybe just some of the documentation. Um, so the fourth the fourth section on uh, winning peace at home and abroad deals largely with not only but largely with um, the freedom newspaper um, that many many of the black communist women wrote in. Um, whether we're talking about, I'm just going to name some of the names, Vicki Garvin, uh, uh, Dorothy Hunton, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, um, Yvonne Gregory, and so forth. Um, so what was the Freedom newspaper? Um, I think it was interesting to learn that Lorraine Hansberry, who, you know, people know is Raising in the Sun and things of that nature, um, she, wrote, she wrote for this, you know, prior to that um, becoming a big deal. Um, so, you know, how did how did those black communist uh, women um, use that paper and how did it influence like their ideological analysis and vice versa? So just a bit about Freedom. Freedom um, was a radical sort of Harlem based uh, newspaper that was founded by Paul Robeson in 1950. Um, it covered domestic and international affairs um, concerned with the sort of global African world, broadly speaking. Um, it also, interestingly enough, was one of the key sites for the battle around to, for Paul Robeson and all, and then later Du Bois to get their passports back. There was a lot of, of coverage of that. But anyway, um, it was uh, Louis Burnham was the editor of Freedom, and then Lorraine Hansberry was sort of like his understudy. Um, so she um, she came in as his like apprentice, but she also served as like. Um, a subscription clerk, a receptionist, a typist, an editorial assistant. So she had a very large role in freedom. And I think that's something we can glean from that is that there's all of these critiques of like, you know, black men oppressing black women or men, you know what I mean? But if we look at some of these black radical, um, if we look at the communist party, it's not to say that, that there was not male chauvinism right. but freedom is a sort of a, a example of like black women and black men black women being in prominent positions at this newspaper like on the editorial board um publishing um as much as as any men um the other thing to 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 think about with freedom is that free that all of the sort of continuity so burnham for example like louis burnham um, worked with some of these other uh, radicals in the Southern Negro Youth Congress. After Freedom Folded, they went on later on to found um, Freedom Ways. Many of these people who are working at Freedom also worked in the Civil Rights Congress. Some of those women went on to found or join for Truth and Justice. So there's all of the, there's like these feedback loops between the people, like the comrades. They're working in all these different areas um, to have these different approaches to the broader struggle. Um, and so I just wanted to say that about Freedom Newspaper. And then um, I don't know if you had anything else to add, Jody. I'll just add that um, and one of the things that's so exciting about Freedom is the way that the, um, particularly our women um, in there, but you know, all of the pieces are articulating a a really cohesive view of internationalism, of a kind of international approach to peace, an anti-imperialism, a pan-Africanism, all kind of Im mutually imbricated with each other. So that there is an alternative to mainstream reports about, oh, you know, the U.S. has to stop communism in these places. And we and stop it where stopping communism is like the code word for um, continuing and supporting um, imperialism and colonialism. And now there's and here in freedom, you've got a totally alternative um, view uh, to the mainstream that really emphasizes the prospects for peace, the necessity of the movement against colonialism and the anti-colonial struggle and the way that these different struggles are connected with each other. Right. Um, 
CBS, I know you said at the beginning you had some um, stuff you wanted to share. Oh, yes. So this is just the, um, let's see, how can I do this? Uh, Should be able to share. So. Yes, uh, I don't know. Okay, so yeah, so this is just the first like um, volume of Freedom Newspaper. This is like volume one, um, number one. So Paul Robeson, he would have his like um, little column um, in each of the things. See there talk about um, Negro, de- Negroes, the man and end of the American frame up system. So that's what they call like the legal lynchings. Um, they got some, you know, some, um, they talk about Patterson. So William Patterson, he was held in like contempt of court. Um, somebody called him like a black son of a bitch. Like anyway, so like, <laughs> Um, he was one of the many people who are being trying to be like held in contempt and thrown in jail for a number of reasons. Um, you know, they do like, they have some different, like just regular reports about like U S um, U S politics. And then they, they have, you know, their internationalist um, section U S to probe South African discrimination. Now what's interest what's important about freedom newspapers that they were one of the only black newspapers to profile um, anti-apartheid struggles in 1950. So this is 30 years before that huge anti-apartheid movement because of um, Paul Robeson and, and some of the other people's um, involvement in the Council on African Affairs, they're like on the anti-apartheid struggle heavy and almost no other black newspaper yeah, is doing is, that. So that's really important. This is really, that's really early uh, mm-hmm. on the anti-apartheid mm-hmm. struggle. Yeah, yeah. It's really, so like 1948 is the inauguration of the apartheid system. This is 1950. Mm. You see? Wow. So I just thought, you know, I just wanted to show um, one of these, you know, that's the, that's the first issue. <laughs> <laughs> very Eurocentric, yeah. Yeah, very Eurocentric. For those who are listening, um, is there any way to get access to those so we could link that? Yep, the archive is completely free. Uh, so the it's on. I think it's the New York Public Library. Like the freedom, all of the um, um, issues are digitized. Um, I have to think about what the link is, but if if you if you Google Freedom Newspaper Digital Archive, everybody can have access to them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll 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 link that in the show notes for people who. Even if you're watching, for people just look look into further. But I think again, those those things are important because it's not. I, I guess another thing I want to make sure people don't think we're making. Even I think we made it clear we're not making a diversity argument either. So this isn't simply just you know oh there were black people in the party, so it's not racist. Like we're not doing the black friend kind of thing with the communist party. Where like that's not. If either one of you want to speak to that more, but I just want to make sure like. Like, it's kind of like we distinguish the difference even with intersectionality and triple exploitation earlier. Like, the difference between just having black people like as faces, kind of window dressing, and like actually black people being involved in the day to day struggle of the party. I guess more so as a question, like, what is the difference between that? Like, the just kind of black faces involved that we put out to show that we don't hate all of these folks versus like the day to day, like we're actually involved in the day-to-day struggle. Like what is the difference between those things? And it, um, it, it seems to me like when you just said it, actually in your question, the answer is, it's like, are you involved in the day-to-day struggle right. or are you just making lip service? Um, one of the things that I that I think is just really important that people need to to recognize when we're talking about um, you know these black communist women is one they were involved in building and forming the communist party there would have been no communist party without their work there right. wasn't it's not like oh here's the white P- communist party and then let's go find a couple of black people no the party was built um, in part by you know particularly um, um, the you know William Burroughs and um, Grace Campbell um, additionally black women were in the leadership. Like Claudia Jones was a major party leader. Um, She and her um, writing and Thelma Dale's writing there, it was appearing in the part. um, Oh my God. It's not the party organizer. It's the, it's political affairs. affairs. Yeah. Political affairs, the dominant party theoretical vehicle. So again, it's not just like, Oh, 
we were going to have like, you know, a couple of people say something. No, it was like, this is, they're doing the ma major theoretical work con and contributing to this uh, major publication. Um, and then additionally, it has, it's, it comes out in what is the position of the party? Is the party out there taking positions like the um, Black Belt Nation thesis? Are they engaged in actual struggles like they were um, with the Scottsboro Boys? I mean, that's not just window service. That's like real engagement. So it's not just like, you know, oh, I don't know. There's a difference between, um, as I you know argue in some other places, there's a difference between allies and comrades. And um, mm -hmm. Black people from the beginning were comrades in the Communist Party. So, for example, like it's it is it is the their work around Scottsboro and the invasion of Abyssinia that draws Claudia Jones, Queen Mother Moore, and a whole bunch of other uh, like a whole bunch of other Black people into the Communist Party. It's the work that they're doing. It, it's the work that they're the Harlem Tenements League is doing. You know the way that um um the communist party was organizing these um unemployed councils so it's actually the practical work that they're doing that is even when it's not specifically um based on race it is relevant to their their they're the only political party for example that is integrated they are constantly pushing back against segregated shops. Like even like the unions are in the the, the, the red um, international labor union organization. They're pushing back against segregated shops, right? In the South. And so they, they falter because these are still white people in the United States. They're, they're constantly working to embody a truly anti-racist. So Gerald Horn talks about how they really were the first people to really implement affirmative action in the sense that if it is like they were trying to model the society that they wanted to create with black people in leadership, with inter like interracial shops, shops like union shops with, you know what I mean? Um, you know, at take like um, integrating Negro work into the dominant work of the party, as well as having separate Negro commissions, right? Which is this idea, because there was, there was some debate about whether Black people should be the ones, the only ones organizing amongst Black people because they had self-determination and agency. So some people believe that and other people are like, the white comrades got to hop in here because this is dangerous, hard work. And the number of Black people in the party are small. And so they were trying to accommodate all of these things. So it shows that they, in and they were making updated updates and strategic pivots in the work. It's not just theoretical shit. They're doing stuff. So in the midst of all this, you know, we are seeing like the second rare scare beginning and with all the work that had already taken place that was going well, then we we see that this there's an influx in the impact of this. How did the Second Red Scare then come in and impact communist organizing as a whole? Um, uh, I can start with a sort of short answer. Namely, it sent a lot of people underground and um, over into Canada because the party leadership was arrested. Um, some of the largest... Um, and most expensive trials up to that period of time were the Smith Act trials of Communist Party leaders. Um, and it, it hurt the party, right? A lot of people lost their jobs. I mean, hundreds of people lost their jobs. Um, and um, it, it, I, I would say that the, co the Communist Party in the United States never recovered from that. Yeah, and it's, that's also why when you see a lot of these people moving through these different organizations together, it's because they were these like the civil rights, like so Vicki Garvin, for example, she was somebody that was blacklisted. She ultimately ended up going to Ghana and then ultimately teaching English in China. Uh, she went to Nigeria, then Ghana. But anyway, because, but she, some of the only people in the US who would employ her were these sort of black radical entities like Freedom Newspaper, like the Civil Rights Congress. So they were literally not able to make a living if you were a communist, a so-called fellow traveler, or even if you were accused of being so, if you had, a, if you owned a Paul Robeson record, that can be grounds by which they judged you as being a communist. So like this shit was real and it's ongoing from sort of the first Red Scare onward. But there's, again, there's these moments of intensification in the Korean War was the 1951, like, or 1950, that was a profound intensification of 
anti-communist disciplining around internationalism, around peace activism, around civil rights activism, all of these things were red baited as communists. And so like it had a, you know, it, it had a profound impact, but they continued. You know, the Peace Information Center was founded in 1950. That's what got the boys indicted as an agent of a yeah. foreign power. But the the um, the uh, the Sojourner for Truth and Justice was organized in 1951. You had the National Negro Labor Council organized in 1951. So they're still doing stuff. They don't let this render them inert. And then some of our long distance women, people like um, Marvell Cook and Louise Thompson Patterson, Dorothy Burnham, they go on to be central in the free Angela Davis campaign in the in the early 1970s. So they're still organizing and they're still bringing those skills to bear, the skills that they, uh, they honed with Scottsboro, then with Rosalie Ingram, then with Willie McGee, they bring those skills to bear on organizing international campaign to free Angela Davis. And so it, and I think that Dale Gore's radicalism at the crossroads is important here. So it it had a horrible impact on the party, but the, these black women continue because they had to. <laughs> Freedom wasn't here yet, you right. know. So. Um, while that's uh, you know, maybe not exactly why that's happening, but I know you all both noted in the um in the introduction. Um, I'll just read the quote. So this is this is uh we include writings focused on a period spanning roughly from nineteen nineteen to nineteen fifty six. We already talked about that, but an era bookend by black women such as Grace Campbell and Williana Burroughs joining the US Communist Party in its formative stages to the mass exodus of black and white communists from the CPUSA in nineteen fifty six after Khrushchev, the general uh, secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, gave his quote quote unquote secret speech in February of that year condemning Joseph Stalin and revealing a number of atrocities committed under his leadership that were previously unknown to communists. So just like we were saying with um, um, the popular front on a, maybe a lesser note and some of the racism within the party, these things get used as a way to discount like all the organizing. Um, so one of the even more popular narratives is, um, <clears throat> is, is Stalin. And I'm not getting into a ideological debate on that right now <laughs> i'm not asking y'all to get into that either thank you say what i said you were thank you <laughs> but uh, but like i think with 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 the stalin thing obviously there was a, a mass exodus uh and and you either one of you can speak to the history of the secret speech and you know how some of that has played out more that we know a little bit more now than they probably knew then uh, but how did that impact the decline of the CPUSA? You know, we already talked about the anti-communist side of it. Like, what were some people's views on the um, the, 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 the atrocities that were revealed about Stalin um, at the time, or at least that came out of that speech? Like, how how did people take that? And just you know, just generally, how how was that? What, what factor did that, did that did that play? Um, uh... I've got one sort of, this is a, maybe a slightly irreverent answer, but in um, Nell Painter has a book, The Autobiography of Hosea Hudson. And Hosea Hudson had been a sharecropper and then a steel worker in Birmingham, Alabama, and was an early member of the um, Communist Party there in Alabama when it was very scary um, to be a member of the party. And he said it was the party that taught him to read. And um, when um, the um, secret speech stuff came up, he's like, well, um, you know, Joe, you know, Joe Stalin never did anything to me. And so it wasn't something that impacted him, right? It's not something that made him think that it's time to leave the party. Um, in fact, one of the, the things that mattered to him more were what was the what was the party's views on like how was how did the party help him in his life? How was the party involved in the um, struggles in the South? How was the party um, allied with anti-colonial struggles more broadly? So he didn't leave the party at that time. No Marvel Cook um, didn't leave the party. She stayed. Like so, Doxy Wilkerson, who I love, and I'm going to write a book about, but he was like one of her best friends. He left. Um, he is funny. There's a letter that he wrote to like, I mean, he has his, his resignation letter. Then he had, you know, 
so you know he doesn't he doesn't get he just says like all that has happened so he can he's probably referring to some people infer that he's referring to just like the mccarthyism some people infer that he's referring to like the what's called the khrushchev revelations um but we also have to understand that at this time this is when cointel pro was geared at the communist party i think it was called common fill at this time literally infiltrate the communists communist infiltration that yeah. literally morphs exactly into Cointel Pro. So this is happening at the exact same time, right? Which means massive destabilization. So all of all of those counterintelligence efforts that go way back to whoop, Marcus Garvey um, are being applied to um the CPUSA. And so all of that to say some Esther Cooper Jackson stayed, you know, Jim and her husband stayed, like William Batterson stayed, LTP stayed, um, Marvel Cook stayed. So a lot of people stayed, you know what I mean? And again, they had these debates within the party. And so I'm not knocking anybody who left or who stayed, but it, the the results were varied. And some people left because they felt like the Negro work was not being taken seriously. Some people felt because they was like, I want to get a, I want to be able to get a fucking job again. Like, right. let me nip this in the bud. Some people left because of, you know, because they were like, oh, how dare Joseph Stalin doing this? Mind you, they didn't leave the U.S. and the U.S. was doing the shit still neither here nor there but so you know so people have all sorts of reasons for leaving and for staying but i do know that at one point in the 1960s there's something that said that there were more like fbi agents in the communist party <laughs> than there were actual like actual members and so what that means for and we have to understand that in 1954 there was something passed called the communist control act this was this was the um the act under the uh, this was the act under which Claude Lightfoot was actually indicted for his particular case. And that literally made it illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. That was subsequently overturned. Um, but at that moment, 1954, it was illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. You could literally be indicted, which if, if it's illegal to be a member of the Communist Party, that means people can fire you. They cannot hire you. All of those things that go along with that. And so that repression and then and so in that context these crucial revelations is just another like a blow right um had that had that happened in another period who knows right what the effect would have been but like to make a short story long some people say some people left yeah right right i think given the fact that like you know so many people were then like in fear of their life they're in fear of their livelihood their kids lives we see this mass exodus of people leaving the country as a whole and going over and we know there's um a lot of work that still got done overseas that we still get to see and that, that's actually really included in, in the book as well um but then like because of that there, there needed to be a shift right we you this you both have stated and, and people know that like people just didn't stop being a communist um they didn't it, it's not just like a switch that i that somebody turned on like this is how folks live this was the work that, they, that was being done in their everyday lives so like how we we talked a little bit um initially about how that moved underground but how did that shift well people just join like so it's okay so just like okay so an analogy is like a lot of the women who went on to like be active in the women's liberation movement they came to consciousness through organizations like SNCC and Con um, the Congress of Racial Equality. So in the civil rights movement, right? And then they went on to funnel those energies into other foci. Likewise, people who were in the Communist Party and who came to consciousness with the Communist Party, even if they left, they went on to found other organizations. And just because you're not in a party doesn't mean you're still not a Marxist-Leninist. It doesn't mean that you still don't believe in some of those forms of organizing. So people just simply went on and, and you know, some went into the feminist movement, um, you know, some stayed in the party. Many of them were um, mentors to later generations. So for example, like Louise Thompson Patterson and William Patterson were very influential on Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale early on. They had a break at a certain point, but they were mentors to Angela Davis, right? Angela Davis joined the communist party like in the 1960s when at an extremely low point, right? And she joined the California Communist Party in particular because of the tutelage of people like, um, you know, so, so some of the like people like Dorothy Burnham, for example. And so 
I think, you know, people just, they kept on, kept on. Some became prominent in like the, you know, the, um, the, the black feminist movement. Um, some went on to be, you know, participate in the black liberation movement. As I stated, many of them were on the free Angela Davis committee. Um, Marvel Cook was a secretary. Louise Compton Patterson was like the, I think the Nash, um, no, um, sorry, Louise, uh, Marvel Cook was a treasurer. I think Louise Thompson Patterson was like the national secretary. Dorothy Burnham was on that committee. So, you know, they just, they keep doing what they do. <laughs> Struggling for liberation. Yeah, and it's a good question because it shows that they weren't completely stomped out. You know, like that there's obviously it had a major impact and obviously the civil rights movement probably would be, I don't want to say better, but it would have just been different. <laughs> You know, had there been a stronger Communist Party uh, at the time, but it, it's good to show that these this didn't just completely die off. Like they didn't completely just kill every everything and everybody's ideas. Um, so that's a good question. Um, but speaking of how I guess historically it does come off that way, like like even when we talk about some people who are famous, like Lorraine Hainsbury, we'll never hear that she was a communist at all. Like that's never going to be in any any um, history book that you get in school or really any of these women that are named in the book, if we hear about them, we won't hear about them in that light or their relationship to it. Um, so I, I guess one, one last anti-communism question in what way is this like the ongoing anti-communism, even of today, um, a race, the historical involvement of black women in the communist party and as well, just is in communist politics period, even if they weren't in the party itself. Yeah, um, I think that you've also, also you've hinted at the um, answers to this one. It's by erasing um, people's communist involvement. It's acting as if it, there was no such thing. And so what you, what you see is like, um, particularly for it, when people are focused on the present, is like, oh, there's the civil rights movement. There's the 60s, there's the 70s, as if that's when everything starts and nothing happened historically. And by acting as if nothing happened historically, right, as acting as if the first half of the 20th century um, there, the contributions of these Black communist women get totally erased. And then that what that makes the movement look like is liberal. It makes it look like the only political orientations that Black people in the U.S. have ever had are either liberal or nationalist. And that anything that is socialist is just for white people, rather than recognizing that, in fact, there has been a long, long history of black communist and black socialist fighting and organizing in this country. And that just get, and that gets completely that's not visible. And then the same thing happens um, with, um, you know, from this perspective of feminist politics or women's politics, which then makes it um, really seem like all women are, in, are involved in a politics that would separate them from men. They're part of this gender division when, you know, Claudia Jones is already, you know, critical in the 40s of this kind of genderism that presumes that women and men are separate. She thinks like that's like a, a part of the way that the that capitalist and the ruling class keep people separated, particularly um, working class people and black people where men and women are always, you know, sort of much more connected and are don't see one another as the enemy. It doesn't mean there's not domestic problems, I'm not saying that, but it's not the same thing as a kind of, like she attacks kind of um, Sigmund Freud and the way Freudian Freudianism is influencing people's approach to to gender division as if men and women are never tied together in material ways that lead them to um, fight the same fights. Um, so I think that the um, the that anti-communism completely distorts our understandings of American history and also our understandings of the very political movements that people are part of in the present. Like we, it's just like big hunks of it have been erased. Yeah, and I think that the other thing too is that what we see is that even as there is like male chauvinism, there just is more opportunities for black women to be in leadership positions than in almost any other organization. And that's the critique that comes out of the 1960s. And so extrapolate into the past and act like this is a trans historical thing. But if you look at 
a lot of black women's activism in like the CPUSA, you can, you have a different narrative. And again, it's not, it's not that the communist party was some panacea, but you do see black women driving theory. You just do, you just see it. Right. And so to, it, 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 causes us to rethink some of these narratives that become sort of trans historical, right? And I think that the second, the other thing too, is that what happens because of anti-communism is that people try to save their heroes from communism, right? We see it happen with Du Bois. We can see it even happen with Claudia Jones. Like people are like, yeah, she was a Marxist, but she was a feminist. Like it's her feminism that, you know what I mean? It's feminism that made her relevant. So people try to save like their faves or try to distance themselves from the communist party or what they will do to try to discredit the communist party is point to all of those divisions and all of those debates and not the resolutions. Like they act like um, black people came, became radical after they left the communist party or, you know, black people were somehow dupes when they were in the party and then they came to their right mind when they left. So there's, it's a kind of like a linear progress narrative type deal when it's like, no, their pro- people profoundly came to consciousness and con- even if they left, they continued on in that work. And also many people did, some people didn't leave. That's the other thing too, is like, this is the idea that all of the black people left like in the 19, either the late 1930s, or in the 1950s, some people stayed communist, period. They stayed communist their whole, they died communist, right? And so I think that that's really important to emphasize as well, because, um, you know, we in this country, like people feel like they can't do, it's this, it's fucking liberalism. Like you can't do something until somebody shows you that it's been done. Like no black person apparently knew that they could be president until Barack Obama was. And so because we have this weird top down mentality for good or for ill, seeing that there's so many black women who are communist or communist adjacent, it's kind of like, oh, okay. Socialism is not just this white shit. Like black women were actually doing big things and driving what was happening. Um, so, you know. Yeah. No, thank thank both of y'all for that. Cause yeah, just I mean, once you like actually look up the history, the notion that socialism or communism was is just a white thing is just it's just kind of, it's just a joke at that you know it's like what are you talking about? Obviously, there are Eurocentric versions of Marxism, like there are Eurocentric versions of everything. Like I said in part one, if we base Christianity off of um you know, white Christians, then, you know, Jesus would just be understood as a terrorist. You know, that would, that would just be the, like, there would be no other conception of it because if you just use, if you use the followers of anything and you find the worst version of them, you'll always, you can, if and you want to say that that's the, that is how we should understand it, then you'll always find a bad version of everything or everything will suck basically. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't really hold up as, as a narrative that, you know, that we weren't involved in it or we didn't push it or it's just, you know, I don't, I don't think there's really much just more to say on that point. Um, I'm curious what, if to, to y'all response, just on the, just straight up on the myth itself of Marxism and the Marxism and socialism aren't like both exactly the same thing. You can be a socialist and not be a Marxist, but people on the outside often throw all of these things in the same boat and they don't make those distinctions, even if we do. So I'm just curious to what y'all think about this idea that 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 any of these ideas, Marxism, communism, socialism or anything, quote unquote, left is considered, um, you know, Eurocentric or white. I mean, I think that means one doesn't know anything about the 20th century. <laughs> so that's just that's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Period. You know, and I think that I can attest to the fact that, like, I came to the whites, including Marx and Lenin, late. I came to Marxism through Walter Rodney and Amilcar Cabral and Claudia Jones and Du Bois. Um, you know, even CLR, like CLR is a whole other sort of <laughs> a whole other genealogy of Marxism. But even you know that those. Louise Thompson, Pat- so like literally, um, you know, Bronx slave market and, and again, to the neglect of the problem of New York woman, those were like the texts that I came to Marxism through. It was not through any white. I knew that I knew Marx was, I knew Marx was white, despite, you know, people trying to say like, that's actually just Frederick Douglass or whatever. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> 
you know, but or he mixed race because he has some woolly hair and shit. I, so I knew that I know that they're white, you know what I mean? But like, there's just too many, there's too many black people, too many revolutionary people, third world revolutionaries who found utility in scientific socialism to just say it's some white shit or to think that that's that their actual contribution is whatever is outside of that. Because of course, black, you know, black people stretch the shit. Like that, that, that is the point of scientific socialism. It can't be abstract. It has to be articulated to your, your um, mm -hmm. historical and, um, and material conditions. Duh. Right. And so I think that to say that Marx's locus of enunciation was Europe is different than saying that it that Marxism or scientific socialism is Eurocentric. And to conflate those two is to be a goofy motherfucker. Like people believe in gravity, <laughs> new and white. So like, are we just, you know, so like, so you're Eurocentric if you believe in gravity? Like yeah. get the fuck out of here. So it's just, you know, we have yeah. we have to stop being goofy. Yeah, Wadzarati said in 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 the Sorry, I'm thinking about a conversation I had off air, but in the decolonial Marxism book, um, one of those essays, you know, he's he says, you know, electricity. Like, do you if if the people who created electricity are are white, do you turn off your lights? Basically, like, you know, if you if like if you look around, I don't want to talk about electricity today. <laughs> yeah, my my fault. That's a, that's a soft spot, but. <laughs> Based on your house, maybe electricity is racist, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, but but yeah, like I, the idea that something that is not it's I, I you said this on part one. I was like, it's named after Marx. You can't solely track it to Marx and end it at Marx. Like, and even the, the claims people make about Marx often aren't true either. You know, as far as like they didn't even care about anything outside of Europe or whatever. But like, even those claims aren't true. Um, but I, again, I just, I just think that I think it's, it's just really not very sensible. And I think people need to question why, particularly with Marxism or socialism, they take that, they take that position that it's a white thing or whatever in an age in which many people are embracing a more, even in pop culture, a more diverse perspectives on ways to be black and black people are in a monolith. Like you hear all this type of stuff, but when it comes to this, it's still just like, oh, it's just a white thing. So I don't I think- But I capitalism think, is some white shit. If you yeah. look at the ruling class, but you still think you account, you're actually not a capitalist. You're actually a worker yeah. peasant or a peasant. I don't know, peasant, but like, yeah. you're, not, you're not a capitalist, but you still believe in that bullshit. And that is some, you know, that's literally some Euro American, if you, understand the origins of capitalism the architecture of that thing is you're all american but you still believe in that like it's it's completely illogical right and it and it assumes that people didn't practice any version of collectivism before marx wrote something down whether you want to call it scientific socialism or not people were practicing some versions of we should share our resources like that was happening in other places in the world you know and that was one of the tensions with Marx is whether you could track that kind of historical development from, you know, slavery to feudalism, you know, and then capitalism and then, and then socialism. If you could, if every, if every society went through that kind of stage of development or class struggle, because some of them didn't, I mean, Cabral kind of wrestled with some of this too, but those are deeper theoretical questions that people can read in the notes or whatever. But I uh, want to thank you both for being here, you know, despite, any technical difficulties that we had that were outside of our control. Thank you both for being All right. here. I think as always, um, especially with this episode, I think a lot of what we discussed is incredibly necessary, but um, for those who might, this might be their introduction. I always ask people when they come on, like, where should people begin? For those who need to mm. get their feet wet and dive in slowly um, to really understand all of this as a whole, um, in a manner that impacts them and their work today and like what they're doing today like where should they start organized fight win <laughs> it's about to drop literally literally they are accessible they are readable yeah. they are explanatory copy you get you a copy so they're short book. they're good Mm -hmm. Yeah, that book does help demystify it because if you think you're going to open it and you're going to get <laughs> a bunch of questions about dialectical materialism and how no. to <laughs> deal with 
with the motions of capital. Like it's not any of that in there. Like it's very practical trying to just simply understand the conditions um, and reading just reports in many cases of just like how many people work in this industry? How can we, how many black women work in this industry? How can we help organize? And then working and then just using the principles, many that we talked about on part one in a very practical manner to figure out what to do. Like it's not a lot of, um, again, it's, there are no equations in the book. You know, there's no questions of like surplus value and all like none of that's even, I mean, there might be mentions of it, but there's, there's not, it's not written like capital. We joked about capital in the last episode, but it's not written like capital in, in that sense. Like it's not the, the writings of those women. It, it doesn't mean that they weren't smart or just as smart as Marx. It's just they were they were moving it to a different stage. So I think it's just important to to highlight that. It drops on what day? October 4th. Okay, yes, what I thought. This well, will drop at the end of September. So you, if you're listening to this, you know you can pre-order it's 40 order yeah so pre-order it um it's not like some of the books we've some people we've had on where the books like 50 <laughs> so yeah pre-order it um and i know y'all will have other talks and you know we'll be doing other work so you know check them out we'll leave the information in the show notes but uh you know thank you everybody for listening i think we put this one to bed so yeah. thank you so much thank you both all right, bye-bye. Bye. Uh, okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seem like my homie.